My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, for the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Tomorrow's first reading is from the book of Deuteronomy. And in it, Moses <coughs> encourages the chosen people to take the law seriously. And he sees it as a great gift. Now, Israel, hear the statutes and decrees which I am teaching you to observe, that you may live and may enter in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. Hear the statutes and decrees that you may live. So the word of God, Lord, your word to us, is not just ordinary speech, right? It's not just representational or symbolic like something over here that stands for something over there. But their life and ultimately, look, they're your life. You are the word and you are the life. And Moses has this sense, which we should all have, that this is a great privilege the chosen people was just one among many peoples on the earth at the time and there were other nations which seemed to be more advanced or if our, if god waited a little bit a little while he could have chosen the greeks or the romans the egyptians certainly were around and were pretty cool um I don't know what was happening in China, the Ming Dynasty or something, but um, right there were other peoples that, that he could have chosen. And, and why them? Why them? Well, just because. It's a gift. It's a choice of God. There is no reason for God's free choice and Moses is aware that this is a great privilege. We call it luck or fortune. Observe them carefully, for thus you will give evidence of your wisdom and intelligence to the nations who will hear of all these statutes and say, this great nation is truly a wise and intelligent people. For what great nation is there? that has God so close to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? Or what great nation has statutes and decrees that are as just as this whole law which I am setting before you today? That sense that we're special because God has chosen us and intervened. They've been spoken to by God. They're chosen by God. And if that applies to the, if that applies to the, um, to the holy people of Israel, certainly it applies to the church. And the Christians of all times, there's always millions, billions of people who aren't yet Christian. And why us, Lord? Right, why'd you choose me and not someone else to be a Christian or in this vocation? As our father would call it, the supernatural lottery. To be so close to you, to know you so well. 
Why me? And the answer is just because, just because God chooses, it's a gift. And St. James talks about God is precisely giver of gifts in the second reading. Dear brothers and sisters, all good giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no alteration or shadow caused by change. He willed to give us birth by the word of truth, that we may be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Humbly welcome the word that has been planted in you and is able to save your souls. Salvation is a gift. It's a gift of a word planted in us, which makes us born of God. He will to give us birth by the word of truth that we may be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Humbly welcome the word that has been planted in you and is able to save your souls. What a deep and powerful and mysterious way of thinking about the word, the word of God. It's not just God telling us things about other things or even about himself or God um, telling us what to do, giving us commands. It, the word of God saves us by being planted in our hearts. And in our heart, it's like an element of, of change, of, of uh, conversion, The um, Moses later on in Deuteronomy will speak in this way of how close the word is to them. And it's so close that it's, it's right there inside of them. For this commandment which I command you this day is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up for us to heaven and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. The word in our heart, as James puts it, the word has been planted in our heart. Humbly welcome the word that has been planted in you and is able to save your souls. And we know this, um, this, has its deepest meaning in the word made flesh. If the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that incarnation of the word, which is right here, just a couple of feet from us in the Blessed Sacrament, the incarnation of the word in Jesus is not meant just to dwell among us during his time in Nazareth, but is the church that the church is the extension of the incarnation through time, and therefore is each one of us. And Jesus says, Behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. And where could he be, Lord? Where could you, where could you be if not in my heart? If anyone keeps my Father's command, my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. We make our abode with him. 
the word is made flesh and dwells among us. <clears throat> and where does he dwell? Well, in our heart, right where he's been, where he's been planted. And so instead of thinking about our Christian life as rules to follow or commands to carry out or ideas that we have to like sign off on, it's more like gardening. Right? There's, a, there's a life planted in the soil of your soul that's growing, right? that wants to grow. And it's nothing less than the life of Jesus, right? The life of God. And so what do we have to do? Well, we have to, I don't know. I don't garden. Um, <laughs> but I guess we have to, like, prepare the soil, right? Uh, fertilize it and get rid of rocks, and weeds, and roots, right? We have to make it more receptive. We have to make it more capable of giving life. Because, Lord, we, we want to respond to this incredible gift. Not everyone has Jesus in them, as we do. Not everyone has been chosen, right? A few are chosen for the benefit of the many. Isaiah talks this way about the Word of God, which is in wisdom literature, um, of course, a prefiguring of, of, of Jesus, of his mission. And again, the image is image of like organic growth and life. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and return not thither, thither, T H I T H E R. I, I'm going to miss this copy of the Bible. I have to give it up soon because it's like falling apart. But some of it's kind of, <clears throat> kind of hard to read. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and return not thence. But water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. The word of God is like a seed. It makes things bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. What a great privilege, Lord, to have you growing in us, living in us. You're with us always through our every action and thought and desire in a state of grace. Anything that's not a sin, our, door, our Lord does with us in grace. And then the most, I think, one of the most powerful passages in all of Scripture is from St. Paul, right to the Ephesians. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled 
with all the fullness of God. This, Lord, is our Christian life. It's not abstract. It's not theoretical. It's not just following rules. That we may be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man and that Christ may dwell in in our hearts through faith. Being rooted and grounded in love, we then have the power to comprehend what is the breadth and length and height and depth of God. So we look and we have to, you know, what was wrong with the Israelites? Well, they started to see the law as a burden. And St. Paul talks about this. It, it had to be that way because they didn't have the grace to live it. They started to see the way of life demanded of belonging to God and God's life in them as an imposition, as a burden. And so they complain, and God does a great thing for them. They're like, well, at least we had flesh pots in Egypt, and here we are out in the desert now. And it's always this pull, right, between, <clears throat> between the immediate success and pleasure and controllability of the idols in the world and staying faithful to God. Right, the life that God wants them to have and live. And of course, Lord, this happens to us when we, when we only look at it as rules and obligations and the thou shalt nots and the kind of self-restraint and austerity that you want us to live. Well, we start to see it as an imposition. as opposed to the life of God, right? Dwelling in us, wanting to grow. Humbly welcome the word that has been planted in you and is able to save your souls. And does this mean behavioral changes? Of course. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deluding yourselves. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So does it mean living in a certain way that's different? Of course, because God is God is different. And the soil, Lord, that you've come to change and grow in is my heart, and my heart is sinful, and my and original sin, my own bad habits and past sins, my own faults it needs conversion that's what the word is there for and so in the gospel right our lord says look it's not so much what you eat that's a problem what goes into your mouth that defiles you it's what comes out of your heart hear me all of you and understand nothing that enters one from outside can defile that person But the things that come from within are what defile. From within people, from their hearts, come evil thoughts, unchastity, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, arrogance, folly. All these evils come from within, and they defile. They come from within. They come from the soil, Lord, of our heart, and that's and and yet that's where our Lord descends right, to save us. Humbly welcome the word that has planted in you and is able to save your souls. Benedict says, right, that um, to be a Christian is to be in a constant state of conversion. which is, um, of course, demanding, but, um, but very powerful, right? God is always changing us, always changing us, always asking for the next, 
thing, right? Remove that little rock. I want to grow there too. I, this, you need more sun in this field, right? Do your spiritual, do your spiritual reading better. I need more fertilizer. Right? Eat, eat better food. I don't know. <laughs> There's always right. He's, there's always there's always a next step, right? A conversion. Let this go. Let, you know. and then weeds crop up, Lord, because because the we're in this world and we have the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so that's why our Father was so insistent, right? We had to struggle every day for love until the end of our life. There's no there's no getting out of struggle. But for love, for the love that's in us and the love that we want to make our own and, and, and respond to. And that takes humility to look at our field and say, well, what's it like, right? The sower sows the word. How receptive and fruitful is my soil? And perhaps in this context, um, Lord, we can think about our, our gospel reading, our reading of the New Testament, as a way of doing this, humbly welcome the word that, is plant, that has been planted in you and is able to save your souls. This is a very practical way that we can be humbly receptive to the word of God and the word that is God, right, our Lord. By taking care of that, of that norm of three to five minutes of reading of the New Testament and trying to do it with the sense that I want to be formed, I want my heart formed by the word of God. And then we bring it to our prayer as well. That scripture informs our prayer. That our dialogue with our Lord is not just one-sided, us telling him things or us thinking about him, but him telling us things and him helping us think about him with his own words. St. Jerome has an incredible quote About scripture. We are reading the sacred scriptures. For me, the gospel is the body of Christ. <clears throat> For me, the holy scriptures are his teaching. And when he says, whoever does not eat my flesh and drink my blood, even though these words can also be understood as the Eucharistic mystery, Christ's body and blood are really the word of Scripture, God's teaching. When approaching the Eucharistic mystery, if a crumb falls to the ground, we are troubled. Yet, when we are listening to the word of God and God's word and Christ's flesh and blood are being poured into our ears, yet we pay no heed, what great peril should we not feel? Obviously, this is um, analogical, but but it's very powerful. If a crumb falls to the ground of the Blessed Sacrament, well, we get out a purificator and we pick it up, and we consume it or put it in the lavabo. We make sure there's no other crumbs there. We're greatly troubled. And yet when listening to the word of God, well, it's just, it could just be words, and words, and words. If we don't approach it with faith and with this receptivity, something active, powerful, alive, planted in us, 
Right? God's words are seeds planted in us to grow, to grow with God's own life. Sower sows the word. And the word that you sow, Lord, is yourself. Humbly welcome the word that has been planted in you and is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deluding yourselves. And what is doing the word? Well, care. Care for orphans and widows in their affliction. Keep oneself unstained by the world. I believe St. Thomas says right in the Adorate. I believe in every word that he speaks, right? Nothing is truer than this word of truth. Credo quid quid dixi dei filius, nilo verbo veritatis verius. I believe whatever the Son of God has spoken, right? Nothing is truer than this word of truth. And so, Lord, help us to look when we do our spiritual reading or when we bring Scripture to prayer. Well, what impact is it making, right? How receptive is my heart? With how much faith am I reading uh, those words that describe your life or record your teachings, your parables, that tell us about you, who are the word that comes and is planted at first in Our Lady, but then in each of our hearts. Then we can go to her, a mother of the word incarnate. Uh, Pray for us. Help us like you to be this receptive field, right? This fertile, fertile ground for the word of God. That as he was made flesh in you, so too he's made flesh in a certain way in each one of us when we when we convert, when we constantly convert and, and let our Lord, give our Lord more space, right? more room to be active and alive and growing in our life. Our Lady Mother of the Word Incarnate, pray for us. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help, put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me.